When you were a little boy, were you made to take piano lessons? Um, not initially, because I started playing by ear when I was about three. And it was my auntie Wynne used to play the piano. And I used to live with my mum and my auntie and my grandmother. And so there was always music in the house in some form or other, records and a piano. And I played by ear first of all, and then when I was about six, five, six or seven, I can't remember, it's so long ago, that my parents said you should have piano lessons, much against my will, I hasten to add. Um, but I had a nice music teacher when I was young, so it was all right. Um, but I was really, I still am very much an ear-taught person. But I thought you, were, I've read somewhere that you were a bit of a sort of infant prodigy and you went to the... Uh, oh, I went to the Royal Academy of mm. Music for five years um, on a Saturday. It was called a, a Junior Exhibition Scholarship, very much the same as Annie Lennox. So she went there years after me. Um, but, um, <clears throat> yeah, I went there every Saturday morning. So I, meant I went from school to Monday to Friday, Saturday was Royal Academy and Sunday was homework, so I kind of resented it in a way. But I scrambled through everything and got my grade eight. And, uh, but I always wanted to play rock and roll, so I wasn't... I mean, at the Academy, unless you were a brilliant pianist, there really wasn't much scope for you if you were... I could never play with the orchestra or anything like that. Um, so I was really... I flunked most of my exams. I just, just got... I did enough work to pass them. Were you a, always a flamboyant sort of character growing oh, no, up, or was that inside waiting to burst out? Oh, that was well inside waiting <laughs> to burst out. It, 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 so I lived my 20s, in my, uh, my teenage years were lived through my 20s, really. Um, I was always kind of um, very meek and mild and insecure. And when I got my first slice of success, all oh, hell let loose, really. <laughs> you said you always wanted to play rock and roll. I mean, were your early ambitions purely musical? Did you actually want to be a world-famous pop star? Oh, no, I just, I just want, wanted to do something with music. I mean, working in a record shop would have been sufficient. In fact, even when I first started to make it, I was always uh, a big record collector in the early days, and I used to collect imports a lot. And the two major uh, stores in England at that time were One Stop, or London, rather, One Stop Musicland. And two of my friends used to run music then. And even when I <clears throat> had the Elton John albums out and was successful, I used to go in there on Saturday mornings and just help serve because I just love records. So um, just watching records go around as a kid fascinated me. So no, I never, I mean, I was just a very average organist in a very average band. And I left that band, which was Bluesology, um, because, and I think about it now, it's kind of why, how I did the initiative to do it. But we were playing cabaret with Long John Borgia, and I just hated playing to people that just like were eating and stuff. So, and that's how I met Bernie. So, fate's played a great part in my life. I was made about five or six major decisions in my life and that have turned out to be winners. That was one of them. You make it sound as if you're, you became a totally different person. Oh, I from did. How you were in the oh, beginning. I did. Yeah, I would never say boo to a goose. I was very shy. I had a terrible inferiority complex. Um, and when I became Elton John, it was like a new lease of life. I didn't particularly like being Reg Dwight. It had too many unhappy memories and sort of... I hated the word Reg anyway. I mean, it's just a horrible name to kill a kid. You know, it's like calling somebody Cuthbert or Egbert or something like that. So, um, as soon as I was Elton, it was just great. I was just like a new personality. And Reg is kind of coming back into my life a little bit. I sort of relented back on him a bit and uh, it's not so bad now. But at the time, I was just delighted and I'm delighted to become somebody else. This is like Elvis Costello becoming Declan McManus again. again yes, it? it sort of is. Yes, it's, it's, it's not so bad now. I'm, I'm, I'm making my peace again with Reg. But um, are you legally Elton John? Oh yes, I've been it. ever since I thought of Elton John. I was I changed it immediately. I was so delighted not to be Reg anymore. I mean, you, I mean, twenty years of Reg is quite enough. <laughs> I'm sorry, all those Reg's out there, but at the time <laughs> it was awful. You know, I mean, and poor thing. It's like being Wally now. I suppose it's like poor thing. Does songwriting come more easily than ever to you now, or, or is it actually harder to come up with something It's actually, new? and I can see people groaning out there who hate my music, it's actually easier, folks. Um, and, I mean, for example, we, when we did the Leather Jackets album, Gus had already picked, Gus Dudgeon, my producer, already picked the songs that we were going to do. Um, and he said, for Christ's sake, don't write any more songs, while, uh, because otherwise we'll never get, you know, some of the stuff was still from, on the new albums from the Ice on Fire sessions as well. So I tend to write more than I record, um, or, or more stuff than's needed for one album. And when we'd actually finished all the stuff of the album, I wrote 17 songs in three days, which will you know, appear on either the next album or, or other people's albums, whatever. Um, I just it comes much easier, and I'm far. I think I'm far pickier than I ever was uh, before, and uh, it just it's much easier than it ever was. I mean, it was easy anyway. I've never really had that time of, uh, of felt like drying up or anything like that, but uh, it is, it's just as easy, in fact, easier. Do you still write in a very kind of old-fashioned way? I mean, sort of picking over things on the piano, or do you have tons of hardware and stuff? No, I just, 
<clears throat> I've had more. I mean, I'm not electrical by any means. I'm useless. I mean, I mean, I can't even put a plug on a bloody lead hardly. Um, and I pl I've got one synthesizer called a GS1, a Yamaha, and a couple of other. I call them Rivita ones. You know, the sort of silly thin ones, um, which are very useful. But I mean, I put. I like something firm between my legs. Um, and a piano provides that, and so does the Yamaha GS1. Piano between your legs. Yeah, well, I mean, that's, I like playing. I'm not very good at playing. You have to have a, you have to have technique to play a synthesizer like a, one of those Rivita ones. Like the Depeche Modes are very good at it because people may laugh and say well, it's not very good, but it actually is a lot of technique going into it, and it's uh, it's not easy. And I just don't have the patience to cope with it. I do play a lot of, uh, of stuff, but I, I mean, I, I, when it comes actually to playing that sort of um, the Rivita synth, I'm not that good. So I've got this GS1, which is like a grand piano, and you put parking meter tickets in it, and it plays certain things, and it has a little bit of soul in it. It's like a Hammond organ. You, it doesn't record that well, but it has a little bit of of humanity in there somewhere. Um, so and it's also helped me to write differently because writing rock and roll songs on a piano is very difficult. You're limited, and also if you're a piano player, technically you tend to write more chords than needed. I was never a very good four chord songwriter, and uh, even my sort of simple songs like Saturday Nights Alright for Friday aren't four chord rock and roll songs, which sometimes can be the best. I would have loved to play the guitar, but it's too late. I play it on stage at the moment, but it's only a two chord song, so I cheat really. Who did you write the new LP, Leather Jackets, with? Uh, with about nine songs with Bernie Taupin, um, one song with Gary Osborne, and one song with Cher. Now, that's an unlikely relationship, isn't it? That's our uh, first song ever. Well, there's a certain <coughs> amount of flash that you might have in common, I suppose. Yeah, but I mean, that's an odd sort of songwriting. And then it's like writing with um, Hilda Baker, bless her soul, she's dead now. Well, or, or, you know, David Jacobs or something. But Cher, she sent me this lyric. And so I wrote a song to it. It was supposed to be for her album. She's doing an album in the new year. And she didn't, I mean, I sent her the song. She didn't think it was suitable for her, which I was quite pleased with because I thought it was quite suitable for me. So um, that's the beginning of a new, uh, Share Lady Chalk Ice might be the beginning of a new songwriting partnership. But it's mostly talking and, and I've got a lot of songs written with Gary Osborne as well, which I'm hoping to, to give to other people to record. Because one point, one thing in my songwriting thing is I've never had a hit with anybody else. Bernie now has branched out. Bernie lives in Los Angeles and has had number one hits this year with uh, Jefferson Starship uh, and Heart. So, I mean, like the two of us, you thought I would probably write hits with other people. He's done it and I haven't. So, that's still one thing I'd like to do. And with Gary, that's us, um, with writing the music first with Gary and he finishing off the lyrics, um, it kind of gives me that scope. But uh, of the new songs written, the 17 that I mentioned about, 10 are with Torpin and 7 with Gary. Were all those stories in your early days true that you and uh, Bernie Taupin used to sort of write songs by post that he would oh, literally yeah. post I you didn't the really lyrics? I meet him until we like, like six months after we started writing because he was lived in Lincolnshire. It's true. I mean, like, and also, I mean, I still find a lot of his lyrics that I've forgotten about, and, 90, and especially this new lot of nineteen eighty two lyrics, and he'd forgotten about them too. Um, yeah, we did. Yeah, it was. Uh, it, it, we've never actually sat in a room and collaborated on a song ever. We tried to in Hamburg recently uh, on the European tour, and I could have killed him. And I think he could have killed me. It was like, get out of the room, I'll kill you. I know you're going to. I said, I want the chorus to be. I said, I know you want. I'm just trying to find the right chords to go with it. So I don't think enough is enough. I think, well, we just we won't question how it works. We'll just keep it like it is. And it's basically lyrics first, always, mostly, unless I suggest a title to him. Um, don't Go Breaking My Heart was one of the few that I wrote the melody first and he had to write the lyrics to it, which, you know, is not his greatest lyric because I, I suggested the title. <laughs> do, do you have much of a personal relationship then? Or has it always been a kind oh, of Oh, yeah, distance? we're like brothers. I mean, like, we're just like... Did you have a big falling out because there was the time when no, you didn't no, work no, together? No, 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 no. There was, you know, because we just happened to have an... I had an album out with Gary Osborne songs, which is a single man, and at the time he had an album out with Alice Cooper songs, which he wrote with Alice Cooper. No, we never had. A, we had a sort of like easing off as far as writing together because he was in Los Angeles. I had no desire to go to Los Angeles. He did, had no desire to come here. So it, it was obvious that even though we write by post sometimes, but uh, we didn't write so much together. But it was necessary after so much product coming out to have an easing off. But I can't ever see us ever not writing together. I mean, we're 20 years together next year, which is quite extraordinary. I don't quite believe that. I don't feel as if I'm 20 years old, let alone being writing with him for 20 years. But it's true. No, I think we were a pretty firm combination. I don't know if you're able to sort of look back on your career in these kind of terms, but is there a period that you think was like your most fruitful songwriting period? Uh, 
You mean songs that I wrote like a fruit? Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll rephrase that. Obviously, you know, in the early 70s or in the mid 70s when we could do no wrong, it's kind of, you kind of get, if you're successful, you get to a point where you can't do any wrong. It's like Madonna goes through that period at the moment. Phil Collins has been through it. Um, you can't fail. Um, but they wouldn't necessarily be what you thought were your best, best songs. songs. No, they're not. No, some of the best songs are most of, some of the most obscure and bizarre songs, I think. Um, I think I, t this period I'm writing now is probably it's just I'm writing just as more many songs now as I have done in that period of time. In fact, more. Um, but the, some of the songs as, that were hits aren't necessarily my favourites. By I mean, Benny and the Jets is not one of my favourite songs, or it's not one of my choices as one of my favourite songs. Nor is Saturday Night's Alright for Fighting, Island Girl. Um, um, but some of the other stuff, Blue Moves, which is considered to be one of my least successful albums. Um, it's one of my favourite albums. It's the, it's the most sophisticated album I ever made, apart from Captain Fantastic, and it has a lot of my favourite stuff on. And you know, you just uh, sometimes I fight tooth and nail about what comes out of singles, and I'm constantly surprised what is a hit and what isn't. Um, I really am a very bad judge of singles. The only one I was ever really good on was Song for Guy, which nobody wanted to put out, and I was very much up for that because it was meant a lot to me, and it was. You know, everyone said, you can't put out an instrumental, and I thought, yes, you can, why not? And in the end, the disc jockeys put it and forced it out, and I was very pleased. That's about the only time I've been right. Do you think you write better when you're happy or when you're unhappy? <sighs> well, I'm, you know, when you write, Torpin's lyrics aren't exactly an upper. I mean, somebody pointed out that in Yellow Brick Road, even, there's only one really positive song. And his lyrics, and in, on Blue Moose, for example, I had to reject some of the things. I mean, that's a down enough album anyway. But he was going through, his marriage was breaking up at that time. Um, I never really think about the lyrics until I've made the record. And then I think, oh, yeah, that's what it's about, is it? Um, but he'd probably but kill even, me for that. No, um, yeah, I know he writes the lyrics, but I mean, even from the point of, of producing music, I mean, lots of people think well, that the whole I, thing of, like, you know, putting out really marvellous yeah. artistic works of any sort is all to do with, like, you know, inner torment and all that kind oh, of yeah, thing. Oh, yeah, I mean, I can write sad, I love writing sad, really, you know, sort of like funeralistic music. I just love it. I mean, I could write that all day long. So, I mean, I could, and that's very, very sort of. Um, self-indulgent, but I could. I could write things like Funeral for a Friend, Song for Guy, forever, because I love that sort of music. I always take my Enigma variations wh wherever I go and sit there and sob and land of open glory and I'm off. That's the sort of person I am, so I do have to control that side of me a little bit. Um, but with Torben's lyrics sometimes it's not easy because they're, they're very, very sort of self-destructive lyrics and so very mournful lyrics as well. What, what has been your least happy period, do you think? I think, well, my least happy period is my personal life. I mean, I went, I think, um, you know, things, I was always happy with my music and I was very fortunate with my success. Even when it was less commercially successful? Yeah, you know? I mean, I just, uh, I think my unhappiest times have been when I've been unhappy with my personal life and uh, things, you know, have been going wrong that way. Um, I've always been happy with my music because I've always believed in what I've done. I mean, some of it's not as good as others, obviously. But uh, there have been, I think you can pinpoint this some of the high points and if you just look at some of them when the Fox album came out for example there wasn't a particularly happy point in my life and you can tell the album wasn't the greatest Caribou was another example the album wasn't the greatest it kind of reflects in your music sometimes although in Blue Moves was a period where I was very unhappy and that's one of my favorite albums but so uh, um, it, it all depends I mean there are points I never realized that our songs stupid boy that I am boy man um, question mark um, how our songs affected people because I mean I, I always used to, I'm not in love I was particularly in love at that time and that record I mean I played a million times and like I used to just sit in the car and go Ooh! Um, and various other records at certain times in my life and when people come up to me and say oh your songs really touch me I thought oh really and I get kind of embarrassed but that's obviously something I never really thought about too much but they they do touch people and I forgot about that I never realized our songs did that which is stupid but um, there are certain times in my life where certain records really mean a lot to me. That uh, when, I, especially when I was down in the dumps, blowing away by Bonnie Raitt, you know, I was this razor blade time. Um, I'm a very sentimental person. I cry easily. Like, I'm like White House. Hello. I'm Peter Jameson. Anybody here called Peter Jameson? I'm sorry. He's uh, he's just popped out for a turkey sandwich. Thank you. So that doesn't happen again. Um, <laughs> No, so I think we're okay with that, <coughs> with that question. Is it fair to say that your lifestyle in the 70s was that of the sort of typical 70s rock god, overindulgent, um, bit orgy prone or whatever? Orgy prone? <laughs> hey there, orgy prone. Um, 
Well, it was a time of wild excess, wasn't it? In certain oh, sort of yes, rock but circles. music is wild excess. I mean, I got Prince now. What's that if that's not wild excess? You were making films and fantasizing and being sycophantic like that. Um, yeah, it was. I mean, it was completely over the top what I did. I didn't know I mean, when I think about it, look about it now. I've got all the costumes and everything at home and thinking what, how much work I did in six years from 1970 to 76. There were 17 albums, separate singles, tours, and. And I just, I just went over the top. I mean, like when people said you can't wear that, I thought, yeah, oh yes, I can. But then, by the time, and then the punk thing made me look, you know, I mean, if I'd have been, if my success had happened during the punk era, I would have had the highest hairstyle. You'd have had to have a furniture van to take me. I loved that era. It was just so wonderful. I mean, I see, you see people running with their legs tied together for taxis and buses and the bus queue, not even batting an eyelid. Good old England, you know, good old Britain. I mean. Great sense of humour. Yes, it probably was over the top. Of course, it was so. I mean, I'm a very excessive person. I don't do things in half measures. Well, um, what's your lifestyle like now, then? I mean, are you one of these uh, sort of born again uh, sort of? <laughs> you know, you know. I'm not going to no, ask no, me no, if I'm a born again person. No, no, oh, no, I don't no, mean in that sense. No, I mean, I mean, people like Mick Jagger, who used mm. to sort of epitomise that kind of over the top mm. rock lifestyle, are now all playing squash and going jogging and things, mm. aren't they? Oh, I don't play squash. I don't jog, but I'm still very much the same. I mean, I'm pretty, again, if I do something, I do it to excess. Although, I mean, on stage, my current outfits on stage are hilarious. But um, I just, because I feel like being hilarious, I'm, I'm very happy, and I think my stage clothes always reflected my mood to somewhat in somewhat. Uh, I mean, when I came back in 1979, after not touring for three years, and I did the Ray Cooper tour with just two of us, I was very sombre and very sedate, because I just wanted to concentrate on my music, and I was just petrified to go on stage again. Um, which was good for me, that's what I needed to have. But um, I think I'm as crazy and sort of, yeah, I think you slow down, I think you don't, you get uh, sort of excessive in other ways. I mean, I just, I still as crazy as I ever was. I, I never, I bought a badge onto us and I, don't, I refuse to grow up and that's kind of, one has to grow up in certain ways, but on the other hand, I still like to take, I mean, to take things a little unseriously. Has being married changed you? I mean, changed your lifestyle or changed your way of thinking about things? Or? Not really. It's made me much more tolerant and much. Um, but then I, and what had happened to do that in a way? Um, it's been good. It's been you know. It's it was. I never went out with my wife before we got married. I mean, it's like I knew we were going to get married. I knew I should get married to her, and we never you know we went out for a curry and that was it. Um, we got married, and it was great to do it like that. Um, but there was no sort of pre-romance or anything, and it was a great wedding. And no, it's been it's great. Really I mean, a lot of risky, people. Risky though, isn't uh, it? What a gamble. Yeah, but I've always gambled on things that are um, that gut feelings in my career. I've, for example, again, leaving the band in, in, when I was in Bluesology, kicking out my drummer and guitarist and bass guitarist when Captain Fantastic album was number one and we had the, we were the most successful live act. Doing certain things, I, I just knew it was right. And um, if I hadn't taken the gamble at that time, I would have been very, very sorry because I just wanted to. I wanted to change my lifestyle. I wanted to just... I just wanted to make an effort and see if I could do it. And I just knew that it, if I didn't seize that opportunity, I'd probably regret it. And it's worked out really well, and it's getting better and better. And it's three years next February, and a lot of people... I mean, I knew I was setting myself up. I got some wonderful telegrams. You may be on the floor. You may be standing, but we're all on this blank floor. Um, <laughs> but, I mean, you have to expect that, because my former lifestyle was not that of one conducive to getting married. <laughs>